Keeping my focus on exactly the person I want to become. The more that I do that, the more my brain is going to start working for me to be molding towards that light. This is episode number 33 of The Inspiring Talk with Melissa Monty. Welcome guys to The Inspiring Talk. My name is Vijay Gautam. I'm host for this show. Each week I interview today's most successful and inspiring personalities to help you realize your inner potential. Hello and welcome guys to yet another powerful episode of The Inspiring Talk podcast. I am super pumped for my guest Melissa Monty. Melissa has got a very powerful story to share. She has been raped twice as a teenager, lost her friend to suicide and her dad to cancer. She had a serious eating disorder for almost a decade that led to chronic intestinal damage. She has gotten into really bad habits from drinking alcohol to being a drug addict and whatnot. Melissa not only overcame all those challenges, but also today she is a certified yoga teacher and Reiki healer. She is also a host of podcast called Mind Love, where she discusses mindset shifts, energy frequencies, and modern mindfulness through raw stories, personal experience, and inspiring interviews. I got connected to Melissa through a common Facebook group and when I came to know about her, I wanted to get her on the show as soon as possible as she has got a lot to share from her experience in life. In this episode, we discuss about how was Melissa able to come out of darkest phase in her life, what exactly she did to transform her own life, how can you manage the thoughts of past and don't let that to affect your present, how can you break your bad habits, her visualization practice that helps her grow every single day, her story of crashing Obama's election dinner and being kicked out by Secret Service, and much more. I hope you will enjoy listening to this episode as much as I did interviewing her. Now, before I welcome Melissa, I would like to read review of the week for this podcast. Alok Gandhi from Australia writes, The inspiring talk is a great show. Bijay is an awesome host who brings out great value and knowledge from the inspiring guests he brings on. I have enjoyed all the episodes so far and I would highly recommend everyone to listen to this. Keep inspiring Bijay. Thank you so much Alok for your kind review. I am really glad that you have been listening to this show and finding some value on it. Guys, if this is your first time listening to this show, make sure that you subscribe to this podcast and leave a review for your chance to get featured in upcoming episodes. Also, don't forget to take a screenshot of this episode right now and post it on your Instagram story. And don't forget to tag me at the rate Bijay Speaks. Now, without further ado, let me welcome Melissa Monty. Welcome guys inside this episode of The Inspiring Talk. Melissa Monty joins me on this episode. Melissa, thanks for joining in. Thanks for having me. Awesome. It's a pleasure in having you here. Melissa, I listened to the first episode of a podcast and I'm so inspired by the way you bounce back in your life, overcoming every challenges and tough phases life has thrown at you. So we are going to talk a bit about that, uh, more about that rather in a while. But before that, tell me a bit about your childhood. How was your childhood like? I had a really great childhood. Which is interesting because one, I think I was ill-equipped to deal with some things in life because nothing nothing bad had ever really happened to me until I was a teenager. Mm-hmm. So um, what happened there when you turned 16? I think there's a, a pretty um, tough phase in your life uh, from 16 to another couple of years. So can you share a bit about that story? Yes, I basically... Once I was a teenager, trauma after trauma just hit back to back. I uh, was raped twice. I lost my father and a really close friend of mine committed suicide. He um, actually hung himself and I had never even dealt with death before. So I was, I was hurting from a lot of different angles and because I had had such a great life, I had no idea how to deal with this. And it was interesting because my mom ended up 
joining a business program when I was really young and they had a book club. And so every month there was some sort of self-development book. So from the age of like 11, I was reading things like the five love languages and, and books on positivity. And so I thought that the best way to handle this was just to try to be positive and ignore it. But what ended up happening is I, I believe I ignored my pain. And so it started to manifest itself in different ways. And so through my college years, I ended up suffering from a really dangerous eating disorder for about eight years. And so there was just undealt with pain. And then there was this eating disorder that was my biggest shameful secret. And I ended up partying a lot and drinking a lot and um, just doing drugs. And, and, you know, I was in a negative spiral. Mm. Uh, as you said, like you have been through a lot of these tough challenges. And as a teenager, I, I can't understand how difficult it was for you, right? So, um, hitting trauma after trauma and, you know, overcoming all those is obviously not something that has been possible overnight. And I'm sure that uh, you have done a lot work on yourself. And as you said, the seed on you was planted at a very, very young age. So can you talk a bit about how was like that phase or what were the some of the thoughts that came into your mind like you know it's easier for people to think why me you know why i have to go through these challenges right so can you share a bit about what kind of thoughts that you have had on your mind at that time well i remember somebody giving me a book called the mastery of love by don miguel ruiz and this was my first uh self help book that really resonated Again, so it kind of reintroduced me to these ideas, and I I started to think, oh yeah, I do have this power, but it wasn't very real to me yet. And so it wasn't just that I found a book and and started to heal. It was a long journey for me, but I kept planting these little seeds, and I think it kept me afloat a little bit instead of hitting some really really. I mean. I was going to say instead of hitting a really bad rock bottom, but <laughs> my rock bottom was pretty bad. And so, um, but, you know, I think it gave me a little bit of hope. And so I didn't take it as far as I could have. And, and when I, when I got low enough, I just remember laying in bed after a night of binge drinking and I woke up in the morning, just very hungover and, and I was, I did not have very positive habits in my life. And suddenly I like heard a little voice that just said, get up. And so I, I remember getting up, even though I didn't want to. And I started to make little changes and I ended up moving away just to get into a different group of people. I got a good job offer. And so, um, I was just trying to start over, but it took, it took years. I was still suffering from an eating disorder. And I think one of the biggest turning points was I, I did yoga teacher training, which kind of put me in a different group and I was surrounded by like-minded people. And so it took a lot of reading and then keeping myself accountable with a new group of people that, sure. that I ended up making the biggest progress. And then thankfully, I ended up meeting my current husband who is all about positive thinking and, and we bonded over the book, The Power, which is the sequel to The Secret by Rhonda Byrne. And and things just got exponentially better from there. Mm, awesome. So you said to yourself, get up. This is the end of the story. I mean, the part of the story that you don't want to take further in your life, right? So now you started on a, you wanted to start on a rather new journey. And what is the first thing that you have done, right? You woke up on that morning and what was the first kind of action that you have taken, if you could remember? I actually went to the gym. I needed to get some endorphins Ooh, running through my body. There you go. And so you go. I've always been very active, but it used to be in a more, in an, an unhealthy way. I, I had a body image disorder and an eating disorder. And so I was kind of just forcing my body into submission. But I think that's one of the reasons that yoga helped me so much is because it's a lot about developing this relationship with yourself instead of just forcing your body to do what you want it to. And so it was it was just really helpful. It was like a mind body spirit 
healing. But I think, I think the other things that I needed to do was really confront the things that I had buried before. And so instead of just trying to be so positive that I'm not dealing with it, it was interesting. I started dealing with um, a lot of my pain in my mid twenties and especially with this whole me too movement that's been sweeping the world (laughs) these days. Um, that's brought back a lot of emotions too. And so I think that, Mm -hmm. that, that sometimes things come up, uh, things are revisited inside your mind when you can actually handle it. And I don't think I was ready before. And so with enough growth and enough work on myself, suddenly I was able to, and, and there were a lot of tears shed in the last few years and just confronting these things. Mm-hmm. As you said, you surrounded yourself with the right kind of people, right? And the friends that you used to have a couple of years back and the people whom you started hanging out is totally different sets of people, right? So can you share a bit about how hanging out with the right kind of people actually helps you in becoming one of those? Definitely. One of the things to preface this with is that I ended up reading hundreds of books. And so all of the classic uh, self-development books like Think and Grow Rich and The Seven Habits of Highly Successful People, I started to take the common denominators of those books and of successful people and try to apply it to my life as much as possible. So these things can include routines and how you treat your body. But one of the big things is that is the people that you surround yourself with. And they say that you are a sum of the five people closest to you. So that means you have to really be careful in who you select to be those five people. Is that somebody that inspires you or that you aspire to be? So because I a, a lot of my lifestyle beforehand was just kind of drowning my sorrows, I was not hanging out with the right people. And that was a difficult transition because you really want to believe these people are your friends, but you start to make positive changes and suddenly they're nowhere to be found. But it's a blessing because then you can replace those thoughts with with people that are going to lift you higher. And so it's a it's still a very important thing in my life, uh, selecting those people I choose to spend my time with. And especially now I have goals and I'm working towards something and I'm trying to create a purpose in my life. And so I have limited time to hang out with people anyway. And so because of the time restraints and also the effect that it's going to have on you as a person, I think it's important to lay out what's important to you, lay out who you want to be and really define those things and then choose the people around you based on that. True. Since you have said you are very, very choosy in terms of what kind of people you want to hang out with. So are there any specific things or maybe what are those few things or few set of unwritten rules that you have set for yourself in terms of, you know, choosing people? How do you actually choose whether you want to hang out or, you know, build relationship with that person or not? Uh, What is that thing which is non-negotiable for you? The first thing is that the people need to just be good people, karmically good. I don't want to be hanging out with somebody who um, tries to, isn't trying to give value to this world. And the other thing is passion. So it it's a lot easier to stick with your passions and to and to hold that commitment when the people around you are also working towards something. And so those two things, working towards something and then working towards being good. Those are really my non-negotiables. Awesome, yeah. And one thing that for me is uh, I used to have a roommate with me on college and who used to always drag me down and whatever ideas I used to put in front of him and he is always there not to support but to pull me down. So I eventually have to change my room just because that guy kept on saying that I was not good enough, I was not capable because I don't love hanging out or staying in touch for more time with people who tells me that I'm not good enough or I cannot do things. It's crazy, right? How you can let others decide whether you can do or whether you can. Definitely. And 
some people feel bad for cutting these people out of their lives, but you have to realize that all of these little things affect you. When you hear things, it's hard to just cut it out. And so that's what we're supposed to be doing. We should only be making room for those thoughts in our own heads of that we can do what we put our minds to because that's that's true. And so to have somebody that does pull you down, I had a friend like that too. I I had to cut out somebody that I has been one of my closest friends for 10 years because I really had to look at it and I realized it wasn't adding any value to my life. It wasn't working anymore. And so sometimes it's good to just be grateful that these people were in your life and for the time that they were, but when it starts to be an obligation and when it stops adding value, then it's your duty to cut those people out of your life, I think. Melissa, you have went through a lot of traumas in your own life from eating disorder to being raped twice and a lot of them. So one thing that I want to understand from you is getting over your past, right? So how do you get over the past you have had? So I'm asking this because not many people are able to leave, you know, the baggage of the past like you did. So it's it's so hard to let go of those thoughts especially when one has went through the kind of situation you yourself went through in your life. So how do you get over your past? The first thing that really helped me was helping other people through it. I realized this after my friend committed suicide and I ended up volunteering at the suicide and crisis hotline a few years later because I realized that teaching people or guiding people through things it's just a really great way to get an objective standpoint when we're in our own stuff it can be hard to really see the next step but you know then you hear a friend with the same problem and suddenly you're like oh just do this this and this and it makes so much sense because you don't have all this emotion tied to it so i think i there's a saying that says you can't read the label from inside the bottle it's kind of like that. And so I volunteered at the Suicide and Crisis Hotline and helped people. They would they would call the hotline and I'd be the person that they'd an- that would answer the phone when they needed help, when they were thinking about killing themselves. And it was a really tough but really enlightening job or volunteer service. And so I think that's one of the reasons why this podcast has been so great for me. What I'm doing now is is podcasting is a really great way which you can relate to where you open up about your stories and there's just something healing about that about getting it out and not holding it in as a big shameful secret anymore and people say that if you have gone through something tough and come out the other side it's your duty to to show other people how and so first and foremost it's a choice that you have to make if you're holding on to resentment and you're not forgiving the perpetrators, the people who hurt you, or even a lot of times yourself, then it's like there's another saying that it's, it's like something about forgiveness is like holding on to a hot coal and hoping the other person gets burned. You only hurt yourself. And it doesn't mean that you're giving the other person or that I'm giving my rapists the okay with what they did and saying, oh, it's totally fine. It's letting go of those negative feelings myself so I can make room for for goodness or for the value that that my life is supposed to have. Is there any specific thing that you say to yourself or maybe some quotes or maybe some kind of books that you turn when you have those kind of thoughts that come to your mind today? One of the things that's been most important for me, especially recently, has just been visualization. And so that means keeping my focus on exactly the person I want to become. The more that I do that, the more my brain is going to start working for me to be molding towards that light. There's a book that I love. It's one of my favorites. It's called The New Psycho-Cybernetic. It's actually one of the original self-development books. They give it to Olympians who, when they're training, and it it goes into the science of how visualization works. And so there's only a very little that we know about the brain. There, somebody said once that if 
what we could possibly know about the brain is one mile. We've only walked three feet. That's how little we know. And so it's called different things by different people, but um, what psychocybernetic called it your brain's automatic success mechanism. But what this really is, is it's your reticular activating system. And these are the parts of your brain that when you have a goal, your brain works behind the scenes subconsciously without you doing anything and starts to make little changes until you reach that goal. And so that's why it's so important to have a goal, because if you don't have a goal, then your brain doesn't know what to do for you. So it just defaults to those mindless things like scrolling Facebook and watching TV. Instead, when you have a goal, then you can be taking a walk. You can be sleeping. Your your mind starts to highlight these things, these opportunities that are going to bring you closer to that goal. And so now after, after my healing, after really confronting the things that had happened to me and allowing myself to grieve and to feel that and to feel into it, then I feel like I could start to heal. And now my steps is, my next step is to focus on that person that I want to be, what my legacy is going to be at the end of this life, all the things I want to accomplish. And that's where I keep my sight. And when I feel a negative thought coming into my head or a limiting belief, I write it down. I acknowledge it so that it doesn't happen in the back of my mind anymore. And then I replace it with something more empowering. And I might do a meditation or I might just spend my time in the shower instead of just thinking about what I'm supposed to do that day. I I visualize how I want my life to be in a few years. And so you can think of it like this little game that you're playing inside your head. But this game has really, really powerful results. So I'm keen in understanding what actually does your visualization practice looks like. Is it just uh, you're closing your eyes and imagining about the pictures? Or is that some kind of movie that you play on your head? Or is that some kind of stories that you tell to yourself? So what is uh, your practice of visualization? Right now, I'm focusing on becoming more and more specific with it, like actually picturing myself being on stage. I want to do a one of the most inspiring TED Talks. That's one of my main main goals. I want to have retreats, transformational retreats, where I maybe bring some of the guests from my podcast to hold workshops and to speak and to do yoga. So I have a lot of a lot of little things, but now I'm focusing on just the nitty gritty details like do I want children? Where do I want to be living? What am I going to be doing in my day-to-day life? That's another really important thing that I think some people miss that I used to miss in the past. For example, I started a travel blog for a while because I would see all these people on Instagram and how amazing does it seem to be paid to travel to all these exotic places and stay in these Mm. luxury hotels. But then I started to do it and I suddenly realized, wait, So the rewards are awesome, but I don't like writing and I don't really like writing about travel. That's not what gives me energy. And so I went through, I'm not sure if you heard of Pat Flynn, but um, yeah, Pat Flynn has a book called Will It Fly? And it's about validating your business idea. But more than that, it's about actually finding that thing that you should be working on, that that's going to be consistent for you because it takes in your natural gifts and what really does give you energy when you talk about. So I went through that. And one of the exercises was called the shark bait test. And it asked to write a letter to a bunch of people that you know from different areas in your life. So I wrote one to my mom, um, an old roommate, people I've worked with before, a lot of different people that know me from different areas, not just school. And so I asked them what they thought my superpower is, what they see in me. And some of the responses I got made sense. They were things I already knew I was good at. But then there were a few that I wasn't expecting. One, for example, was that I'm good at taking information from a bunch of different areas and explaining it to people. I did not know that's what people saw in me. And it started to put this light bulb in my head. I like to talk. Sometimes it's hard to get me to stop talking. Mm-hmm. I uh, I want to share this information. And what I talk about the most is all about mindset and the power of your mind, because mm-hmm. that's what I feel like saved my life. And so uh, 
yeah, doing the work to really figure out what your perfect day would be. What do you want to be doing when you wake up? What do you want your day-to-day work to be in this job and whatever you want your life path to be? That's a really important step. And so now I just keep focusing on what happens in five years from now. What happens when I have my first digital course or when I do make it to that TED stage? Hmm. And and what what do I want to be doing? from the moment I wake up until the moment I go to bed. And so I've been trying to visualize that as often as possible. For sure, you are going to make it to the third stage because you have got a very powerful story that can transform the world, right? Best of luck with that. Since you have had some habits and obsessions which were not good for your health and uh, some disorders such as eating disorders. So what I'm keen in understanding is how hard or easy it is to break habits and what actually goes behind to break those kind of habits? Well, I wouldn't say that it's necessarily easy. It does take work. But one thing that really helped me was understanding the process of of what it really takes in your brain to build and break habits. So what happens sometimes when we try to break a habit that's always been there, whether it's biting our nails or literally having an eating disorder, when we, when we try to just make a change and say, I'm not going to do this anymore, and we fail, then we beat ourselves up. And we take that personally, like, oh, I can't do this. But there's, there's a book called um, The Power of Habit, and it really breaks it down. They even talk about how to stop biting your nails, and it's, it's realizing what the trigger is, and then replacing it. And so I ended up doing a lot of replacement techniques in my life. One of the things that was, I believe, the only way I could get over my eating disorder was get developing a healthier relationship with food. You, you, it's hard to explain what went on in my brain, but it was, it, it's, it was just really tough. And it, was, it wasn't something that I felt other people understood. It's not something that I understood myself. One day, I was trying this new th- thing. Um, I heard somebody talk about throwing up their food. And then the next day, I'm trying it, thinking this isn't a habit. And then before I know, months went by and it had taken over my whole life. So for me, I ended up getting chronic gastritis, which is a, it's a, intestinal disorder that they said I was going to have my whole life. I would eat the wrong thing and I would be in bed for a whole day when in so much pain. So I had to make a change. So I started reading a bunch of books on nutrition and and for me I I went on a vegan diet and so I don't eat animal products at all and I uh it, I healed my stomach in a few weeks. So that was one of the first steps towards making a really positive change that I felt really good about. The next was was um, developing a healthier relationship with even working out. And so yoga really helped that. But later on in life, if I started to really understand how, how to build and break habits, and it's really about having a plan. Know what your triggers are, know what sends you down the wrong path, and know what sends you up the right path. So if you're trying to build a habit, give yourself small rewards. And actually write out the reward that you're going to give yourself if you do this certain thing and then take it a moment at a time. But these things, the reward system in your brain and the triggers for doing something are a real thing. And that's if you just follow that process, which I highly recommend the power of habit of identifying your triggers, um, whether for the good or the bad, identifying something that you that could be a trigger if you're trying to build a new habit. Like, okay, um, after, after I wake up in the morning, I'm going to, the first thing I'm going to do is drink, uh, two glasses of water or whatever it is, something to where, you know, exactly when to do it. Not just, oh, I'm going to drink more water. You've got to lay out Mm -hmm. the plan. And then what happens if you, if you get it, allow yourself, find these little healthy rewards. My rewards are, I love dark chocolate. Vegan chocolate, mm-hmm. though, <laughs> a piece of dark <laughs> chocolate or a long walk with my dog or watching the sunset, these little things that I love to do. And it's like, ugh, if I don't get this done, I can't do that tonight. And those things work mm-hmm. for me. Yeah, I mean, that has worked for me in the past as well. Um, while I was a student and 
in college formally i mean informal we all are student throughout the life so well i was in college uh, i used to do this a lot uh, like when i complete the certain assignments or maybe some uh, some of the you know reading or some of the work that i needed to complete on that particular day and when i did that i uh, gave myself some kind of treats as you said and little smaller treats and i also uh, did the opposite which was to punish if i was not able to you know accomplish those and some of the punishments that i gave myself included uh waking up early in the morning and taking a shower with very very cold water in chilly <laughs> winter morning that was like even the thought of taking the shower with cold water in chilly morning you know uh makes you work or makes you want to work because you know you have that punishment set for yourself and i had to punish myself a couple of times so yeah that works uh punishment and reward thing really works definitely it's funny because I noticed um that like the punishments work for my husband as well but I noticed that punishments don't work for me my mind wants to rebel and so if I was like oh you have to take a cold shower <laughs> my mind would be like I don't have to listen to you <laughs> so yeah and it just doesn't work and so but that's a good point because people do have to just trial and error and figure out what works for them and what doesn't work it's going to be different True. depending on who you are One thing that I want to know from you is about making a shift of mindset, right? So, how can one start the mindset shift from being a victim of situation that they actually went and to, you know, actually thrive and grow even more stronger after that particular situation or that kind of particular obstacle that they face in their life? I think the most important thing to do is ownership. A lot of people want to place the blame and you know it's very easy. For example, uh, I was raped. Obviously, I didn't ask for this. Mm-hmm. But but taking the ownership for what you can in your life. You may not have had ownership over or you may not have been at fault for what happened to you, but you have complete responsibility for everything that happens after that. So if you allow that moment to break you and to hold you back from accomplishing what you're here to accomplish and from having a good life then that ends up being on you and it's hard to accept but once you do everything can change for you because you realize that even if it's hard and even if there's a lot of healing to be done It's your responsibility to do that. It's it's up to you to take the first step and to kind of um waddle through the swamp until you make it out into the sunshine. So I think just that level of ownership, taking responsibility for what you can and making a plan for what you would like your life to be. And then just take baby steps from that point on. pick one little thing to do each day to move your you towards your goal even if the goal is just to be happy Melissa if you have to give a message to a 16 years old Melissa so what would you want to say to that young teenage girl who was just having pretty good life I think I would like to tell my younger self that it this is one of my favorite books as well but it it the title is so fitting the obstacle is the way i think that things happen in your life to be a mirror for the areas of growth that you need to to go through and so for me i very much feel in line with my purpose just in helping people to come to these realizations about their own power I don't know if I would have felt so strongly about it had I not gone through the things that I've gone through. And so like you said earlier, how people like to say why me? Hmm. I think I did that for quite a while. And I used that as an excuse for for letting my life slip even further because I would say, well, it makes sense that I'm doing this. Look at all I've been through. and that is exactly the victim mentality and it doesn't bring you 
any good. So the obstacle is the way. And to look at these things as an opportunity to grow instead of instead of the rock that's going to bring me down. Melissa, you told me a few days back that you were crashing on Obama's election dinner at George Clooney's <laughs> house and socializing for an hour. So can you share a bit about that? What was that? And uh, how did you get inside that and you being kicked out by Secret Service? So can you share that incident? <laughs> Yeah, and I do have a photo okay. for people <laughs> that are that are thinking it sounds too crazy to be true. But uh it it's an interesting story because I really it still does come back to the mindset and acting like you own the place. <laughs> When I first moved to LA, I made it my mission to be at as many awesome things as as possible. So even when it came to like Grammy parties I would I would show up to the hotel I knew that these things were happening at and bring an empty wine glass or a wine a wine glass with a little <laughs> bit of wine and pretend I was on my cell phone and just be dressed nice and walk uh-huh. in. Well, I did this a lot and so it kind of became a game for me to see what I could sneak into. And Obama had one of those election dinners where people pay like $40,000 was the ticket price for a seat at this dinner and it was at George Clooney's house in his backyard. And so there were only uh 100 people there there are 150 people there there were uh 15 tables of 10 but on the drive up there are about nine checkpoints where security is checking and and police officers are checking to make sure because it's a presidential event mm-hmm. they have to have very heavy security but i was in the limo with somebody that actually was going and and so he was sitting facing the front and i was facing the back in the limo mm-hmm. and at all the checkpoints they just kind of looked at him and they never peeked in and saw me in the limo so i made it to the bottom of the driveway the bottom of the driveway they check his id and cross reference it with the list and then they ask me for my id and i'm like okay this is where i'm out mm. but, but they never cross reference it with the list and so then i get, they tell me to go sit on this on this uh go kart that's waiting to bring people up the driveway and um sitting in the go-kart waiting was Toby Maguire and he like introduced himself to me he's the guy from Spider-Man if anyone's seen it and um and so then all of a sudden I'm like up they check my ID again and still don't look at the list I was blown away mm-hmm. and suddenly I'm standing in George Clooney's living room like <laughs> looking at his family photos and then I'm at the cocktail hour some of the cocktail hour for about an hour and a half and then they finally start seating people uh. and obama had showed up yet and so it was at that point that they realized i didn't have a table but they thought they made a mistake they're like well cuz i just said well how could this be how did i even get let in mm-hmm. <laughs> you know if <laughs> if this isn't right and so they ended up seating me at a table they're like i'm sorry i'm going to have to split you guys up scrambling trying to figure out how to make this work mm-hmm. and so they sit me next to barbara streisand <laughs> and I'm talking to her about men and then I get a tap on the shoulder about 10 minutes later and they they ask if they could talk to me on the side and they're just like we checked everything we don't have a ticket for you and I was like well how did I even get in like mm-hmm. like this isn't my fault I bought a new outfit <laughs> and and uh they said well we can't let you stay because everyone here has been vetted and we don't have time to vet you and the president's coming mm-hmm. and so they made me leave and i'm walking down the hollywood hills <laughs> and the lettos all these motorcycle cops are looking at me because they had finally relaxed and one of them turns and was like leaving so soon and i just said oh yeah i have another <laughs> cocktail party to be at and his god just stopped, like is this girl that paid $40,000 for dinner and is leaving before it happens <laughs> So it was pretty funny. Yeah, that's that's pretty interesting. <laughs> I can still stop laughing because um that's crazy, right? Um breaking into someone's dinner. I have not done anything crazy like that, but one thing that I kept doing while I was in college is going into uninvited uh, wedding parties. So, I mean, I did that a lot of time because just on opposite side of where I lived was a garden and I don't know if you are aware of, you know, Indian weddings like they are huge, right? So, that was the place where weddings used to happen and then uh whenever, you know, there's a wedding and as a college student you don't want to cook food, then it's easier for you to pull up your 
uh, you know, blazer and just go out there and have fancy dinner and come back. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, real life wedding crasher. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, real life. So... <laughs> <laughs> so that's something that I've done many times in four years. I have done that at least 20 or 25 times. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, awesome. Now, um, uh, Melissa, it's time for the enlightening round. Are you excited? Yes, I'm super excited. What inspires you to do everything that you do? I want to empower people. I think that the more empowered the people are around me, the more this universe is going to grow and, and good things are going to happen. We see a lot of shifts happening right now. And I think that the best that we can do is just to show up every day and be the best people that we can be. So I want to help empower other people to do that and, and to help people realize their own beauty, worth, and power every day. There are habits that in each one of our lives, which we believe or which we have been following for quite some time and actually plays the role in changing our life. So which one daily habit do you believe has been game changer for you in your success journey? It's hard to pick one, but I think the one that I've seen the most results from in the last few years is making a plan and really taking the time to define what I want my life to be, what kind of value I want to add to this world and and who I want to be. Because then it, it ends up speaking to everything that I do and everything that moves me towards that. It helps me make decisions faster because I just think, is this moving me towards this bigger goal or is it a distraction? And so I think taking that time, and that means making the plan like we talked about before with vis visualization, also spending the time to visualize, and then I spend every night before I go to bed to plan out the next day. That way, instead of waking up and making decisions on what you're going to do based off of emotion, whether you're lazy or you're not feeling up to it, you know what you are going to be doing from 9 a.m. till 11 a.m. And then when you're taking your lunch, it makes it really easy to see the progress that you're making towards those bigger things when you, when you just take that time to make a plan. Which one book? do you believe has made the most impact in your life? Psycho-cybernetics. I talked about it before, but it really does go into the science of, of visualizing and how to do it for the best results, whether it's building a new habit, whether it's developing a new skill, or whether it's becoming a completely new person. Or, or challenging or taking some big goal, those things that people say, like, make your dream and then make it a little bit bigger. <laughs> it, it really helps. It helps to do that and put that into focus and believe that it can happen. Because I think that, like I said, everything comes back to the mind. And so the first step is believing that it's possible. And I think this book really helped me to see the science behind it, which made it easier to believe that this all wasn't just some woo-woo spiritual manifesting, but it, it's, there's a science. If you were to start this success journey all over again, what are those three things that you wish you could have known earlier or done earlier or uh, maybe would not have done in your life? What are those three things? I think I would have practiced forgiveness earlier. I think I would have treated my body better <laughs> and and I think I would have been kinder to myself because then maybe it wouldn't have taken me so long to to understand my own worth and and why that there why there was more to this to this life than just developing bad habits and getting through each day in an unhealthy way. Is there any online tool or app that you use on a regular basis which has helped you a lot in maybe in, uh, you know, being more productive or maybe achieving your goals or, you know, in, or in general just helps you a lot in becoming more better version of yourself? Yeah, it's interesting because 
I have been, people used to call me the app queen. If there was a, an app for my computer or my phone, I had thousands. I actually used to work in app, mm -hmm. but, and, and it was funny because my husband had, had paper and he'd always be writing on paper and I'd be like, come on, like what century are <laughs> we in right now? But it was when I switched to paper that things really started happening. And so I'm not going to give you an app or a software thing because for whatever reason, those just muddled me a little bit more. I mean, there are some that I use, but the thing that was the game changer is a journal. And so mm -hmm. I used to use, I used to use the five minute journal, which is a gratitude journal mm -hmm. and, and the passion planner until I found a journal called the self journal and the self combines the two. And so every day it asks me what I'm grateful for. There's things to write. There's a whole, the times throughout the day. So I can schedule out my day the night before there's gratitude at night. And then you even write in, you have to write, rewrite your goal every day and write three big wins from the day and also lessons learned. And so to have that amount of check-in every single day where you're focusing on your goal, you're planning it out, you're showing gratitude and you're acknowledging the wins, the progress and the lessons you've learned. It's like this perfect little combination to make you stay on track, not only be productive, but also kind of giving you, giving you the gratitude along with it so that you go in with a positive mindset. Amazing. So Melissa, I have one last question left for you. But before that, why don't you talk about your podcast and how can people actually get in touch with you if they want to connect with you and maybe learn more about you and listen to your podcast and also maybe attend the programs that once you actually launch them, well, I, you can find me at mindlove.com and my podcast is also called Mind Love. So it's modern mindfulness for happiness, health, and success. And basically every episode brings on a new guest with something inspiring to share based on the power of the mind to either overcome or achieve something. And it ends with an action item. Another exciting thing that I just launched that you can sign up for on the website is my daily email called The Morning Mind Love. And so every day for free, you get a, a little inspiring message to remind you of your own beauty, power, and worth. And so that's been receiving a really awesome response. So at, um, at mindlove.com, you can sign up for that and find my podcast. Awesome. Awesome, guys. Make sure that you check her website and see is everywhere on different social media platforms. Make sure you follow her on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter and all those other different places. I will have links to all those on the show notes of this episode at theinspiringtalk.com forward slash 3333. All right. So, Melissa, here's the last question for you. Imagine that you are standing in front of millions of people and maybe let's say Ted decides to do or organize this biggest event ever in the history of the world, right? And the people attending that Ted talk are in millions of number, right? There are millions of them attending there. And but you have to condense your message or everything that you have learned in your life to a one minute message. And you are given that one minute time to address these millions of people passionately sitting there to listen to you. What would be your message? That's a lot of pressure. <laughs> but my message, my message would just be that the sooner you realize your own power and the divinity that's within each and every one of us, the sooner you realize that the sooner you can start giving back to this world and letting that value and that divinity shine. I think that's the purpose of our life is to, is to understand our own power. Because the moment that we do that, we can really be who we were meant to be. And, and that's what we're here for. You are amazing, Melissa. Thanks very much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a lot of fun. Hey guys, thank you so much for listening to this episode. I hope you learned something or got some inspiration. If you did, make sure that you share this episode with your friends by visiting theinspiringtalk.com forward slash 3333. You will also find all the links and resources shared in this episode by visiting Sonor's page at theinspiringtalk.com forward slash 3333. 
I want to give a shout out to Tsuski Pop which is a bi-weekly podcast hosted by Sweetie and Papu who are good friends of mine and they describe themselves as two desi chicks surfing the fourth wave of feminism in Golden Hills and Salwar Suits. Currently in its fourth season, Tsuski Pop explores a wide range of topics from women's issues, especially those affecting women of color, to pop culture, retro Bollywood, film gossip, music, art, and celebrity interviews. Also, while you are at it, do check out amazing art by Sweetie on their website, tsuskipop.com. That is tsuskipop.com. I hope you enjoyed listening to this episode. My special thanks to Melissa for sharing her story with us. Make sure that you follow her on different social media platform and also listen to her podcast Mind Love where she shares tons of information about mindset shift and personal growth. And finally, make sure to follow the Inspiring Talk podcast on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram and spread some love over there. Thank you so much for listening. I'll catch you in the next. Now, go out there and do something inspiring.